Welcome to The Tech Cove with your host, Sean Hosberry. Your questions and interviews, plus lots of accessible software, and just a whole lot of fun. And now, here's Sean. Good morning, guys. We have a lot to cover on the show today, so, um, just lay back, relax, what, don't do that, just enjoy. <laughs> First, we're going to cover a few devices that are made for visually impaired people, and to me, they're just taking away skills that we could use ourselves, but tell me what you think. Sally has the first article on a device that can possibly keep us from hurting ourselves. At least that's what they say. Sally? Take it away. Wearable device helps vision impaired avoid collisions, news from the Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary. An obstacle course was used by researchers to evaluate a wearable collision warning device they developed for patients with peripheral vision loss. They found the device may help patients with a wide range of vision loss avoid collisions with high-level obstacles. Gang Wo, Ph.D., Associate Scientist at Mass. Eye and Ear, Siepens an assistant professor of ophthalmology at Harvard Medical School, adjusts the wearable device that his team created to help those who are visually impaired avoid collision while walking. People who have lost some of their peripheral vision, such as those with retinitis pigmentosa, glaucoma, or brain injury that causes half-visual field loss, often face mobility challenges and increased likelihood of falls and collisions. As therapeutic vision restoration treatments are still in their infancy, rehabilitation approaches using assistive technologies are oftentimes viable alternatives for addressing mobility challenges related to vision loss. Researchers from Massachusetts, Eye and Ear, Siepens Eye Research Institute, used an obstacle course to evaluate a wearable collision warning device they developed for patients with peripheral vision loss. They found the device may help patients with a wide range of vision loss avoid collisions with high-level obstacles. Their findings are featured on investigative ophthalmology and visual science IVs. We developed this pocket-sized collision warning device, which can predict impending collisions based on time to collision, rather than proximity. It gives warnings only when the users approach to obstacles, not when users stand close to objects, and not when moving objects just pass by. So, the auditory collision warnings given by the device are simple, and intuitively understandable. We tested the device in a density obstacle course to evaluate its effect on collision avoidance in people with peripheral vision loss. Showing its beneficial effect, we compared the patient's mobility performance with the device, and without it. Just demonstrating the device can give warning for obstacles in walking would not prove the device is useful. We have to compare with a baseline, which is walking without the device in this case, said the senior author Gang Wo, Ph.D. 25 patients with tunnel vision, or hemianopia, completed the obstacle course study, and the number of collisions and walking speed were measured. Compared to walking without the device, collisions were reduced significantly by about 37% with the device, and walking speed barely changed. No patient had more collisions when using the device than when not using it. We are excited about the device's potential value for helping visually impaired and completely blind people walk around safely. Our next job is to test its usefulness in patients' daily lives in a clinical trial study, Dr. Elwo said. This study is entitled, Evaluation of a Portable Collision Warning Device for Patients with Peripheral Vision Loss in an Obstacle Course. Other authors are Srinivas Punlik and Matteo Tomasi. I think, because I know you well enough Sean, you'd rather use your cane skills than depend on a machine in that manner, 
But what do you think about this, this, idea? That is one device that I will not be asking vocational rehabilitation for the blind to be to get for me. I prefer my cane skills. And, uh, yeah. Um, what adventurous blind person doesn't? <laughs> so, um, speaking of adventurous blind people and, uh, their devices that help them, Lucy Greco has a story that's going to be read by Joy, uh, that explains how her day as a totally blind person is. Now, of course, there's going to be a big story this, um, this show. And, uh, it's going to be about how Disney has a one billion dollar bet on a magical wristband. So, don't miss that. Because it, it's one of those stories that you'd have to hear to believe how simple the magic is. Joy? We all experience technology differently. From waking up in the morning with the aid of a talking alarm clock to commuting to work and checking emails on her Android mobile phone, Lucy Greco, an accessibility expert who also happens to be blind, experiences technology in a slightly different manner than some of us. She gives us a rundown of her typical day interacting with digital devices. I often wonder what backgrounds you, my readers, come from. I am never really sure if a person reading this piece has ever downloaded a screen reader or used an accessible device. This month, I want to reach out to those of you who have not. I am going to talk a little bit about how I use technology and how it affects my daily life. I am not only an assistive technology specialist, but am also a self-confessed technology junkie. If there's a new gadget or technology released, I would usually be one of the first to buy it. Interestingly, there have been a few devices for which the me first phenomenon hasn't come into play. I was the first kid on the block to get an accessible cell phone in early 2000. However, when Apple came out with the first iPhone to include VoiceOver, a built-in, free screen reader for the iOS platform, I never bought one. When everybody was signing up on the social networking site Facebook, I didn't. It wasn't an accessible social media platform and I didn't like the idea of sharing snippets of my personal life online. I have only recently begun using Twitter and starting to enjoy it for the rich content I can find. I guess you can say I have always been a person who wants to challenge herself but not jump onto the newest trends just because everyone else is. Another interesting part of this interaction with new technology is the knowledge that my feedback as a user group in accessibility and assistive technology can influence product specifications. On the flip side, as I become older, I also find it more of a burden to learn new technologies and adapt to newer software for each task. As a blind person, the way I interact with technology is unique. Most of us are woken up by the shrill tones of their alarm clock, either the traditional clock piece is placed on the bedside stand or the mobile phone alarms. In the morning, I am greeted by the traditional alarm clock. However, my clock speaks the time and greets me. I am a light sleeper and often check the clock in the middle of the night. Unlike a sighted person, I cannot just turn my head to do this. I need to reach over and physically push a button to realize that it's almost 4 a.m. and I am still not asleep. The other problem is that the friendly little alarm telling me the time may actually wake up my husband as well. Not a very practical solution, right? Lucy Greco with her guide dog Pecan. The only other technology I encounter in my morning routine is our burglar alarm. My alarm system has a loud voice telling me the status of the alarm. When I reach to turn it off in the morning, it pipes up with a disarmed, ready-to-arm message. As I open the door to let my guide dog Pecan out, it beeps loudly and says back door. I find this very reassuring because I know whenever anyone comes in or enters my house, the burglar alarm's mechanism will alert me. Since I cannot rely on visual cues to know if someone has entered the house or if the door is not completely shut, this little piece of technology is my only link to a sense of security. My next interaction with technology is through my mobile phone, while commuting to work and from there on through the day. Before I leave for the bus stop, I reach for my Android phone and check my emails, Twitter messages, and today's headlines. The app Next Bus tells me how long I have to wait before the next bus arrives. If there is nothing much to read, you would still see me playing around with the phone, either listening to music or pinging a colleague. My phone is an Android and it is a complete touch screen, with no buttons on it, not even a home button like you would see on an Apple iPhone. The only hardware buttons on the phone are the power on, off and volume control buttons. 
Here's where the first difference between a blind person and a sighted person involved in the same tasks becomes apparent. A sighted person reaches into their pocket and in under 10 seconds will have the screen unlocked and the next bus app displaying their stop information. But I sometimes take over 30 seconds just to unlock the screen. The way the Android keyboard works for a blind person is you drag your finger over the screen and whatever button is under your finger is spoken and if you pick up your finger the last button you were touching is typed. My husband is quite concerned about the mechanics of the phone. He's worried about the fact that it takes me overly long to unlock my phone, and so, in emergency situations I might be unable to quickly unlock the phone and call someone. For me, this delay is natural, and I don't know another way of using a mobile. This is the way I have always used a mobile phone. I can't target the individual buttons I need to find and when I do, I need to be sure that my finger is resting exactly on the right one before I remove it. Luckily, the new Android phone keyboard is more forgiving than the previous version. Read who is responsible for all the inaccessible technology in the world? Part 1 and Part 2 by Lucy Greco I don't know the number of times I had to second guess myself when pushing the keys of the mobile phone while inputting the password. Since I have a braille display, Sometimes it takes me a few moments to even get the keyboard up if the phone remembers I was last using the display. The Android accessibility suite allows me to use the keys on my braille display to enter text into the phone. However, even when the braille display is not paired with the phone, the phone remembers that it should use the braille display's keyboard to enter text and I need to click a specific spot on the screen to change back to the on-screen keyboard. Personally, I think this is a bug. But for now I deal with it. If a sighted person had to fight with their phone as much as I do, I don't think cell phones would have caught on as completely as they have. Once I reach work, I have a 50-50 chance of finding my computer ready to work the minute I sit down. Many mornings I reach for the keyboard hoping for the ever-faithful spoken initial statement, press Ctrl Alt Delete to log on to be greeted by silence. Sometimes it's a simple problem like the computer isn't turned on but more often than not, it's something as silly as my screen reader failing to authorize itself and unable to speak because it doesn't think it has a license to. I have spoken many times about how copyright accessibility blocks access to information for blind users. This is just another example of that. The copy protection used by my screen reader keeps my computer from speaking as it thinks that it has no license. This is one of the biggest headaches I have to deal with at work, on and off. Starting my work day with licensing problems and poor screen reader implementation of the licensing is not something I recommend. When I manage the lab used for student exams on the Barclay campus, this particular problem would rear its head at the most inconvenient times. More often than not the student would be in the middle of an exam and their screen reader would turn off. The Barclay campus is a large, sprawling center with old buildings. These buildings were not meant to have modern technology infrastructure tacked on after the fact. Needless to say, the network connections couldn't always be relied upon. The screen readers would check for license frequently enough that a 5 second break in network connectivity would disrupt the licensing. But wait, you say. Wouldn't it just check again? No, sorry, it's too late. The screen reader has now set itself to a demo mode and if it doesn't expire instantly, it will do so shortly thereafter. My students and I have lost countless hours of work due to this specific issue. However, without the screen reader, we would not be students or managers, functioning and working full-time in society. Read from Classrooms to E-Accessible Classes Making E-Learning Inclusive, blog by Lucy Greco. Read the article. Recently my campus switched from a departmental support system to a centralized IT system. I was lucky enough earlier to have my office right next door to the IT person. Now the IT staff is located 15 minutes away on the other side of town. Previously I used to knock on the IT door and say, my computer stopped speaking again. Today, if I am lucky, I can grab a person in the hallway and ask them to walk me through saying what's on my screen, or perhaps they will tell me what that flashing error message is that I just can't read. After hearing this. You are probably thinking that I would be highly opposed to something like a shared service center for IT. But no, I am not. When it comes to my basic configuration and support needs, which is shared with every other person in my office, I have found the central service to be faster and more effective. Shared services is a larger pool of individuals with diverse knowledge and backgrounds and I am more likely to get a person who knows how to solve the problem, instead of having to fight through it with a person who has only a narrow set of experiences. My needs are different and my user profile is different than some of my colleagues. I don't need an IT person on call just for me, no one can afford that in this day of highly paid, skilled professionals. What I do need is assistance from an individual who does not need to be paid for their skill set but is affordable enough to be on hand when the need arises. But wait again you say, this doesn't happen often enough to have a person on hand. 
As new innovative technologies flood the market, individuals with disabilities may benefit from them but struggle to use them. Product development always outstrips the accessibility. We can only hope that accessibility eventually catches up, just like the talking clock has. In my next article, I will expand on this issue and talk about other instances when an on-call IT professional could be very handy, not only to aid persons like me at work, but to share with them specific accessibility-related skills that they can leverage and utilize for other clients. I am a highly productive individual who has accomplished a great deal during my time at Barclay. However, with the state of assistive technology, I have a large percentage of uncounted hours struggling just to use the tools my co-workers take for granted. Statistics have shown that individuals with disabilities will stay in the same job their entire lives. A lot of this is comfort zone and familiarity. I might be asking for a little bit of assistance just to get past these barriers caused by technology, but university or business administrations can be assured that by putting a little bit of extra effort into improving tools and the workspace, I will be there when many of my colleagues have moved on. And look who it is. It's Steph. Say hello, Steph. Hi. She'll be in and out with me for a few articles, um, such as, well, not this one coming up, but um, the next one, which will be as far as cheating. Uh, she's going to be a teacher. Well, she could tell you herself, but I don't have the cue cards right here for me. <laughs> Um, she's going to be a teacher, and I want her opinion on a particular article that's coming up. Thank you very much, telephone. Um, or iPhone. Um, so, yeah, Steph, Steph will be in with me, um, for a few articles. And, uh, that'll be good, because being, having technical, t the digital hosts sometimes can kind of suck all the time, because they only say what you want them to say. Anyway, um, so uh, talk to you guys in a, uh, see you guys in a bit. Um, Joey has a an article in particular. Oh no, uh, wrong cue card. Mike has the article in particular, actually. So. Mike here with something to make you think. Social media can make standardized test questions go viral when standardized tests are shared nationwide, as they now are, under the Common Core system. That's been adopted in 46 states. Cheating suddenly becomes a whole lot easier. Especially since teenagers now share just about everything on social media. As we are all aware, platforms like Twitter and Instagram have a way of making illicit activities go viral. According to courts, the testing company Pearson has reported 76 instances of students sharing standardized test questions on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter since February. Of course, we've probably been guilty of cheating on tests since test-taking first began. But this year is special, marking the first time that a large number of states began taking identical common core tests. Many schools are forced to spread the computer-based testing out over multiple days to accommodate all of their students. These two circumstances, coupled with a smartphone arm teenager, may create the perfect storm of conditions for cheating to get out of hand. Right now, testing companies are playing a game of whack-a-mole, monitoring leaked information as best they can, and ratting cheaters out to their schools, which are responsible for taking disciplinary action. If this sounds a bit sketchy to you, you're not alone. We are already seeing backlash from parents and some school authorities, who are concerned about the obvious privacy implications of testing companies monitoring kids' Instagram accounts. It's not yet clear whether or how tech-enhanced cheating will affect test results nationwide. But if there's one inescapable truth here, it's that social media's pervasive influence can no longer be ignored in the classroom. Back to you, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for joining me, Steph. Um, no problem. And uh, since I know you're going to be a teacher really soon, all this uh, lovely drama that's going on with uh, people cheating and using Instagram and Twitter and Apple Share. <laughs> <laughs> but we didn't have the, um, we didn't have the, the cell phones because that's how they're doing it through a cell phone. Just snapping a picture and going from there. Um, in a way, it's a bad thing because it's cheating. Um, but I can see the benefits of it, too, because then people would know what to study for. 
Um, if they used it for that. <laughs> um. Do you, do you think it's Dantron cheat that basically have the answer to, the, or do you mean like a, if somebody took notes, uh, they would be able to, to have the notes down and study for the test instead of. Being yeah, they would know like which notes to study. Yeah. Okay. Um. But I had a teacher last semester, um, who said my tests are going to change next semester because my tests are everywhere and I don't know how and you all keep getting A's. Yeah, that is kind of awkward. But there's only <laughs> one problem with that. And, and well, at least in the article it said uh, school systems are trying to spread the, the tests like days apart because it's a nationwide connected thing. So, right. I don't know how they're going to do this. Especially if, like, you know, say if, if uh, a curriculum, somebody's doing a, a thing in California, uh, they may send the messages some to somewhere like Chicago. Just that fast. It could be that easy yeah. and fast done. Or they could just go back to doing things like they used to do. And... Uh, you know, the, the old-fashioned way, and just keep, keep those Scantron things out of the hands of, pe of kids. You know, lock their well, desks. The reason that they're, yeah, the reason that they're doing it the way they're doing it is because of Common Core. And I... This, this was the thing that you didn't like, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't like it in regards to math, because they... Like, for adding, for instance, they make you subtract to add now. That sounds kind of British. <laughs> it makes no sense whatsoever. Um, but, I mean, I, I agree with some of the concepts, but I don't agree with some of the concepts with Common Core because I like the fact that, I'm, and I'm going to pick on you for a second, um, say that you had a kid and you moved from I don't know, um, Mississippi to California, and well, well that kid is going to be learning the same thing that that kid learned uh, in Mississippi when he gets to California because it's Common Core. I like that, because sometimes you can be in one state and then the next state is way far behind, or way far ahead. So I like that. I just don't like that, you know, you have to do things this way. Hmm. Well, that would be an interesting one if I had a kid. <laughs> Moving to California, yeah, I definitely need my kid to California, but as far as the way they were taught old school, I would, I know I would have a problem with that, with this, the common core thing. It does not sound very helpful at all. Not really. Um, but neither was no child left behind, so. <laughs> the opinions here have been <laughs> <laughs> Um, I have a lot of professors and friends who are teachers, and they will all tell you that No Child Left Behind actually left behind the people who were, who were gifted in, like, three subjects wow. for the people who weren't so gifted in those subjects. That's almost rude. <laughs> or they would leave behind the kids in the middle. You know, those who were, those who were gifted at math, but, but were terrible at English. Well, if it were up to you, speaking from a teacher's point of view, what would you do? Um, as far I, as this situation, as far as the... Part of me wants to say that I would change my test, but then part of me goes, but then you would have to change it every year because the answers would come out every single time. Because I'm... Switching the answers around is out of the question. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not... 
that far removed from the kids perspective so I can see you know that they would take pictures and do that every time. Um, again, speaking from a because I'm curious too. Um, the most annoying thing as a teacher, if you could change it and it magically go across the board since you're becoming a teacher, what would you change? The most annoying thing as a teacher? Yeah. Um I guess for me it would be uh I don't know, there's a lot of annoying things as a teacher. But I guess from my perspective it would be having parents who didn't want to work with you and um didn't you know want to help with fundraisers or or help you know their kids with their homework just because they didn't want to like I could understand you know parents work but or you know just not being helpful at all yeah I can understand that too I've I've had several professors tell stories of they would send their roles home with their students on the first day for parents to sign so they would be aware of the rules too um you know because most teachers do that um and they would have parents that completely would refuse to sign anything oh that's nice nothing well, thanks for your opinion staff um yes i'm gonna keep you right here because um <laughs> and um, besides, there's a, an article that I'm going to let you read here in a second. And of course, our guests are going to hear it in a second. It, it's, it's a little long, but I, I, I'll let Joey give you the gist of it. <laughs> it's um, basically what's going to happen to our future restaurants. So Disney is leading the way, which is kind of creepy. And you think ordering food or an app is kind of off-putting? Wait for this to come out. Mike here with something to make you think. Social media can make standardized test questions go viral when standardized tests are shared nationwide, as they now are, under the Common Core system. That's been adopted in 46 states. Cheating suddenly becomes a whole lot easier. Especially since teenagers now share just about everything on social media. As we are all aware. Platforms like Twitter and Instagram have a way of making illicit activities go viral. According to courts, the testing company Pearson has reported 76 instances of students sharing standardized test questions on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter since February. Of course, we've probably been guilty of cheating on tests since test-taking first began. But this year is special, marking the first time that a large number of states began taking identical common core tests. Many schools are forced to spread the computer-based testing out over multiple days to accommodate all of their students. These two circumstances, coupled with a smartphone-armed teenager, may create the perfect storm of conditions for cheating to get out of hand. Right now, testing companies are playing a game of whack-a-mole, monitoring leaked information as best they can, and ratting cheaters out to their schools, which are responsible for taking disciplinary action. If this sounds a bit sketchy to you, you're not alone. We are already seeing backlash from parents and some school authorities who are concerned about the obvious privacy implications of testing companies monitoring kids' Instagram accounts. It's not yet clear whether or how tech-enhanced cheating will affect test results nationwide. But if there's one inescapable truth here, it's that social media's pervasive influence can no longer be ignored in the classroom. Back to you, Sean. And now it's time for the Kids' Corner. Accessibility wise. Kids Corner Update Accessible Game On by Robert Gingett. Sony has launched their system update, Yukimura, bringing never before seen accessibility features to the PlayStation 4, including text to speech support among many other features making the console more accessible for disabled gamers. Users can download updates on March 26. Yukimura improves the experience for many disabled users in a several ways, 
including adding custom button mapping. This update enables global button mapping that stays prevalent in games and will hold the map structure till it is turned off. The update also includes zoom for displayed pictures and inverted colors for all system functions, apps and in-game as well. The text-to-speech will work on all graphical user interfaces related to the PS4. This means that TTS will work in places such as party chat, reading PSN messages and friends lists, and other applications in the PS4 GUI, including the Twitch chat since it uses the PlayStation GUI. Enlarged text will work for all PS4 interfaces, including message and party, as well as the system's browser. Alongside this, users can opt to make the text builder for all system applications but won't apply to games or third-party applications. Though not illustrated or mentioned, these visual aids will work in the PS Store. At the time of this writing, it isn't clear if the TTS will work in the PS Store as well as the main interface. According to their blog post about this update, Sony writes, Following the update, you'll be able to smoothly pick games up right where you left off, find and connect with friends quicker, customize your experience and share your most epic moments in a more meaningful way. PS Vita owners will receive all the accessibility benefits as the PS4, including text-to-speech features and Zoom options found on the PS4. PS Vita Update Version 3.50 and PlayStation App Update Version 2.50 adds new accessibility options, including enlarged text, increased contrast and more. This update will enable PS Vita to support 60 FPS streaming for remote play. I know we've been article to article back to back, and thank you, Steph, for dropping in while you could. Um, the one of the second to last articles Joey has, and uh, it's fairly long, but it takes the magic totally out of uh, <laughs> out of having Disney experience. I almost feel bad for doing this. But for people who are curious, this is how Disney's magic is completely done. Yes, yes, I know, I know. The reservation's going to be on time. Don't you just hate it when your smartphone gets a little too smart with you? Anyway, check out this article about Disney's $1 billion bet on the magical wristband. It's Disney's $1 billion bet on a magical wristband, featured by Wired.com. The magic band wields access to the park, replacing virtually every transaction you'd make inside. If you want to imagine how the world will look in just a few years, once our cell phones become the keepers of both our money and identity, skip Silicon Valley and book a ticket to Orlando. Go to Disney World, then, reserve a meal at a restaurant called Be Our Guest, using the Disney World app to order your food in advance. The restaurant lies beyond a gate of huge fiberglass boulders, painstakingly airbrushed to look like crumbling remnants of the past. Crossing a cartoon-like drawbridge, you see the parapets of a castle rising beyond a snow-dusted ridge, both rendered in miniature to appear far away. The gothic-styled entrance is teensy. Such pint-sized intimacy is a psychological hack invented by Walt Disney himself to make visitors feel larger than their everyday selves. It works. You feel like you are stepping across the pages of a storybook. If you're wearing your Disney Magic Band and you've made a reservation, a host will greet you at the drawbridge and already know your name, welcome Mr. Hasberry. She'll be followed by another smiling person, sit anywhere you like. Neither will mention that, by some mysterious power, your food will find you. It's like magic. A woman says to her family as they sit. How did they find our table? The dining hall, inspired by beauty and the beast, features baroque details but feels like a large, orderly cafeteria. The couple's young son flits around the table, like a moth. After a few minutes, he settles into his chair without actually sitting down, as kids often do. Soon, their food arrives exactly as promised, delivered by a smiling young man pushing an ornately carved serving card that resembles a display case at an old museum. It's surprising how the woman's sensible question immediately fades, unanswered, in the rising aroma of French onion soup and roast beef sandwiches. This is by design. 
The family entered a matrix of technology the moment it crossed the moat, one gear toward anticipating their whims without offering the slightest clue how. How did they find our table? The answer is around their wrists. Their magic bands, tech-studded wristbands available to every visitor to the Magic Kingdom, feature a long-range radio that can transmit more than 40 feet in every direction. The hostess, on her modified iPhone, received a signal when the family was just a few paces away. Hasbury family inbound. The kitchen also queued up two French onion soups, two roast beef sandwiches. When they sat down, a radio receiver in the table picked up the signals from their magic bands and triangulated their location using another receiver in the ceiling. The server, as in Wade person, not computer array, knew what they ordered before they even approached the restaurant and knew where they were sitting. And it all worked seamlessly, like magic. No matter how often we say we're creeped out by technology, we tend to acclimate quickly if it delivers what we want before we want it. This is particularly true of context-aware technology. Just consider how little anyone seems to mind now that the Google Maps app minds your Gmail. Today, Google Maps is studded with your location searches, events you've arranged with friends, and landmarks you've chatted about. It's delightful, and it took hold faster than the goosebumps could. The utility seems so obvious, your consent has simply been assumed. The same idea is taking hold at Disney World, how did they find our table? A friction-free world. Walt Disney borrowed against his own life insurance to pay for Disneyland's original design, and according to friends and family, he never seemed happier. It was his sandbox. You will find yourself in the land of yesterday, tomorrow, and fantasy, he crowed in early brochures for the park. Nothing of the present exists. The expansion of Disney's empire brought Disney World to life in 1971, and within that world, Epcot was to be the experimental prototype community of tomorrow. Disney wanted people to move in and live with technologies the rest of us could barely imagine. In a way, the Magic Bands and their online platform, My Magic Plus, realized that dream. But not in the way he imagined. The design of the bands themselves teach users how they work. Access points have an encircled Mickey logo which matches that of the bands, showing that they can be touched together for access. Matt Strochain, Disney. The Magic Bands look like simple, stylish rubber wristbands offered in cherry shades of gray, blue, green pink, yellow, orange and red. Inside each is an refid chip and a radio like those in a 2.4 GHz cordless phone. The wristband has enough battery to last two years. It may look unpretentious, but the band connects you to a vast and powerful system of sensors within the park. And yet, when you visit Disney World, the most remarkable thing about the magic bands is that they don't feel remarkable at all. They're as ubiquitous as sunburns and giant frozen lemonades, despite their futuristic intentions, they're already invisible. Part of the trick lies in the clever way Disney teaches you to use them and, by extension, how to use the park. It begins when you book your ticket online and pick your favorite rides. Disney's servers crunch your preferences, then neatly package them into an itinerary calculated to keep the route between stops from being a slog or a frustrating zigzag back and forth across the park. Then, in the weeks before your trip, the wristband arrives in the mail, etched with your name, I'm yours, try me on. For kids, the magic band is akin to a Christmas present tucked under the tree perfumed with the spice of anticipation. For parents, it's a modest kind of superpower that wields access to the park. If you sign up in advance for the so-called Magical Express, the Magic Band replaces all of the details and hassles of paper once you touch down in Orlando. Express users can board the park-bound shuttle, and check into the hotel. They don't have to mind their luggage, because each piece gets tagged at your home airport, so that it can follow you to your hotel, then your room. Once you arrive at the park, there are no tickets to hand over. Just tap your magic band at the gate and swipe on to the rides you've already reserved. If you've opted in on the web, the magic band is the only thing you need. It's amazing how much friction Disney has engineered away. There's no need to rent a car or waste time at the baggage carousel. You don't need to carry cash, because the magic band is linked to your credit card. You don't need to wait in long lines. You don't even have to go to the trouble of taking out your wallet when your kid grabs a stuffed olive, looks up at you, and promises to be good if you'll just let them have this one thing. Please. This is just what the experience looks like to you, the visitor. For Disney, the magic bands, the thousands of sensors they talk with, and the 100 systems linked together to create My Magic Plus turn the park into a giant computer, streaming real-time data about where guests are, what they're doing, and what they want. It's designed to anticipate your desires. Which makes it exactly the type of thing Apple, Facebook, and Google are trying to build. Except Disney World isn't just an app, or a phone, it's both. Wrapped in an idealized vision of life that's as safely self-contained as a snow globe. 
Disney is thus granted permission to explore services that might seem invasive anywhere else. But then, that's the trick every new experience with technology tends to gently nudge our notions of what we're comfortable with. The Magic Band sports RFID, and a radio inside, which allows sensors to locate its wearer. Designing the experience. Disney shrouds its creative process in secrecy. This is both strategic and cultural. The company doesn't want its magic tainted by the messy realities behind the curtain. That's particularly true of the magic bands. Piecing together their origin required more than two dozen interviews with executives at Disney, and with designers and engineers who worked on the project, but could speak only anonymously due to non-disclosure agreements. Though the team behind this sprawling platform eventually swelled to more than 1,000 people, the idea started years ago with a handful of insiders. People jokingly called them the Fab Five an almost sacrilegious reference to Mickey, Minnie, Donald, Goofy, and Pluto. In 2008, Meg Crofton, then president of Walt Disney World Resort, told them to root out all the friction within the Disney World experience. We were looking for pain points, she says. What are the barriers to getting into the experience faster? The Fab Five were not just Imagineers, the demigods of fun, who create Disney's attractions. They also included high-level veterans of the company's sprawling operations division, executives intimately familiar with the gnarly realities of running the park, from catching people trying to scan the ride reservation system, to making sure parents are reunited with lost kids. But the Fab Five's work-a-day roles did land a grand vision for Disney's future. They came back with a drawing of the Magic Kingdom without turnstiles, Crofton says. But, she adds, there was a domino effect in making one decision. Everything was wound together. No one knew this better than John Paget. He was the project's most forceful advocate, and his name appears first on more than a dozen patents associated with My Magic Plus. Within the company, this cascade of new technologies, and the dream of overhauling the park, thrilled some and threatened others, who fretted over the sheer complexity of it all. The Fab Five drew particular inspiration from the then, nascent wearables market. The possibilities seemed nearly endless. They were especially intrigued by the Nike Sport Band a fuel band predecessor that synced with a heart rate monitor and a pedometer in your shoe and fed data to a wrist-mounted display. Nike was using it in virtual events like the Human Race, a global, virtual 10K run that used wearer's pedometer data. What if Disney did something like that? The Fab Five thought. What if a band could be the key that unlocked everything at Disney World? They assembled Frankenstein-like mock-ups using spare parts scribbed from hardware catalogs and torn down gadgets. The team debated whether visitors would unlock the experience with a band a lanyard, or even a Mickey Mouse hat. Their vision finally began lurching off the workbench in the first months of 2010, in a decommissioned theater that once hosted the Mouse Tears live show. That lab became the place to showcase the vision, says Nick Franklin, who with Crofton oversaw the team. It became the blueprint for the development teams. The Fab Five were stationed in an area of the park designed to evoke a studio backlot. The building itself looked a bit like a small-town movie house in the 1950s complete with a marquee framed in bright lights. It was fronted with broad windows that had been blacked out, and the place appeared to be closed. The benches out front offered a quiet place where harried parents could rest for a moment, then yell at pouting children, we came 3,000 miles to get here, and you, will, have, a, good, time. Tucked away in a vestibule behind the glass, within earshot of those unsuspecting visitors, were 30 or so designers and engineers arrayed at makeshift desks highly stressed and occasionally hung over from a night spent drowning their frustrations. It was just weeks and weeks of long days and traveling to Orlando, says one consultant who worked on the project. At the end of day, the only thing to do was drink with the team. The oblivious families wandering past offered one of the few diversions from their grueling work schedule. In the early stages, the room they shared was maddeningly cold because they couldn't turn off the AC. Everyone suspected it was part of the same system cooling guests at Toy Story Midway Mania next door and messing with that thermostat was tantamount to sending a cash cow to the slaughterhouse. So to make up for it, Disney staffers offered mountains of sweatshirts and blankets and gloves from the park's many gift shops. Despite the conditions, the work inched forward. Great swathes of My Magic Plus the Magic Bands and their readers, along with pieces of the web portal for making ride reservations already worked. The bands themselves had been designed, as had the kiosks that would light up with a pleasing chime any time you swiped. That already represented a slew of feats, chief among them, the Magic Band's novel tear away design that ensured they'd fit nearly every wrist on the planet. The band looks simple enough, a colorful center panel surrounded by a dove gray border. But if the band is meant for a child, a parent simply peels away the gray outer edge. Adults can wear it as is, intact. We had models ranging from what we called the shack wrist, to that of a child, 
and everything in between, says another designer. Disney was adamant that the band's design reinforce two key values everyone is equal in the park, and everyone is welcome. It took one engineer six months to get the tear away channel just right, it had to be easy to tear, but it couldn't inadvertently come apart. Meanwhile, the readers had to be intuitive enough for people to instantly know how to use them. The design has a novel and clever cue, simply touch the circled Mickey icon on the band to the circled Mickey icon on the reader. When everything works, the reader flashes green and emits a pleasing tone, if something goes wrong, it glows blue, never red. Red lights are forbidden at Disney, as they imply something bad happened. Nothing bad can happen at Disney World. Beyond the vestibule, through a set of double doors, was a sound stage with a full-scale demo of the revamped Disney World experience. It was a cavernous space covering 8,000 square feet, with 50-foot ceilings. By 2012 it had been divided into a dozen or so rooms, using enormous black curtains that hung from the ceiling. Each room stood in for a stage in a visitor's trip, from the living room where the family might reserve its rides online to the hotel's shuttle bus, to the hotel, check into the lines for Space Mountain, to the futuristic restaurant booking system they'd invented. We were using the interfaces and technologies that would ultimately get deployed, Franklin says. This was an X-ray version of the Disney World experience, a view directly into the bones of the park's commercial infrastructure. All these vignettes playing out on the sound stage were a way of getting Disney's board of directors to sign off on the $1 billion cost of deploying the full system. The dress rehearsal worked. People like CEO Bob Iger, and Pixar board member John Lasseter, who was new to Disney and on a path toward reinventing its animation studio, were led through a two-hour tour that unfurled according to a fastidious, continuously refined script. They loved it. What followed was two years of grinding work transforming a scripted prototype into a real-world performance then another 18 months rolling it out in the park. The sound stage became a training ground for Disney's employees, who are called cast members. Today the sound stage has been disassembled. There are few photos documenting what happened there, due to the secrecy of the project and Disney's mandate to never show the mess behind the magic. By the summer of 2013, when magic bands first trickled into public tests, they would change almost every detail of the meticulously plotted choreography that rules Disney World itself. Tom Staggs has the ramrod posture trapezoidal jaw, and friendly face of a former varsity star you encounter at your high school reunion. When we meet in a teleconference, he's at Disney's corporate headquarters in Burbank, California, and I'm in a large room hidden within the support wings of Disney World, a continent away. I'm surrounded by charts and graphs, projected onto the wall, displaying all the information constantly flowing in from the park. Here, beneath a speckled drop ceiling, at a long folding table, in a room that looks like it's been set for a PTA meeting. You can imagine the park breathing people in, breathing data out. Staggs, now the chief operating officer of the Walt Disney Company, as a whole and until recently the chairman of Walt Disney Parks and Resorts, is widely thought to be in line to become Disney's next CEO. He was the one who had to sell Iger and the Disney board on Magic Band. Like many corporate bigwigs, he has a talent for hiding radical ideas in a cloak of suave common sense calibrated to calm Wall Street. But every sentence he utters seems to be a cone that encapsulates years of teeth gnashing about the ever-expanding borders of high technology. Staggs couches Disney's goals for the Magic Band system in an old saw from Arthur C. Clarke. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic, he says. That's how we think of it. If we can get out of the way, our guests can create more memories. He offers a story about how a program called Fast Passes once guaranteed a ride time at premier attractions like Space Mountain. It used to be that those passes were issued at the rides themselves, and stamped with a designated return time. You had to be there when it opened, because passes went quickly and unless you were a scheduling savant, it was hard to hold passes for more than one ride at a time. You'd see families waiting outside for the park to open, then fathers sprinting for a kiosk to get enough passes for everyone in the family. I used to be that sprinter, Staggs says. You can see why he and Disney would be so keen on the bands. Instead of telling your kid that you'll try to meet Elsa or ride It's a Small World, Franklin says, you get to be the hero, promising a ride or a meet and greet up front. Then you can be freer to experience the park more broadly. You're free to take advantage of more rides. There is an elegant business logic here. By getting people exploring beyond the park's top attractions, overall use of the park goes up. People spend less time in line. They're doing more, which means they're spending more and remembering more. The whole system gave Disney a way of understanding the business, says Franklin, who stepped down last July as Disney's executive vice president of Next Generation Experience. Knowing we need more food here, how people are flowing through the park, how people are consuming the experiential product. It also allows Disney to optimize employees. 
The goal was to create a system that would essentially replace the time spent fiddling with payments and tickets for moments of personal interactions with visitors. The Magic Bands and My Magic Plus allow employees to move past transactions into an interactive space where they can personalize the experience, Crofton says. What started as a grand technology platform has inevitably changed the texture of the experience. Meanwhile, the digital world and the ease with which we carry it around in our phones has filled our lives with new expectations and endless entertainment options. I can't think of a business that isn't affected by more choice and more access to information and an increasing desire for personalization, says Staggs. So if you're a theme park, you have a strange dilemma that echoes the dilemmas we face in our digital lives. Walt Disney World is vast. There's more to do than you could do in a month, Staggs says. That choice is overwhelming. The access points glow green when things go as planned, but blue if there's an exception. In fact, it's called the paradox of choice. You make people happier not by giving them more options, but by stripping away as many as you can. The redesigned Disney World experience constrains choices by dispersing them, beginning long before the trip is underway. There are missions in a vacation, Staggs says. In other words, Disney knows that parents arrive to its parks thinking we have to have tea with Cinderella, and where the hell is that Buzz Lightyear thing, anyway. In that way, the park isn't a playground so much as a video game, with bosses to be conquered at every level. The Magic Bands let you simply set an agenda and let everything else flow around what you've selected. It lets people's vacations unfold naturally, Staggs says. The ability to plan and personalize has given way to spontaneity. And that feeling of ease, and whatever flows from it just might make you more apt to come back. Will the world at large ever become something akin to Disney World, loaded with sensors attuned to our every move, designed to free us? There are signs. It's already starting to appear on Disney cruise ships, and Staggs says airlines, sports leagues, and sports teams have asked about the technology. We're just at the beginning of understanding what to do with this, he says. What Staggs doesn't share, but what former team members do, is that Disney already has conceived, designed and engineered many more features that seem to border on science fiction features even more ambitious than delivering your food to you without your having to ask. The Magic Band contains sensors that let guests swipe onto rides and allow Disney to pinpoint their location. At Be Our Guest, there would enable the radios in the table and ceiling to triangulate your location so your server can find you. If Disney decides to install those sensors throughout the park, a new world of data opens up. They could have Mickey and Snow White find you. They might use the park's myriad cameras to capture candid moments of your family enjoying rides, meeting Snow White and stitch them together into a personalized film. The product teams called this the story engine. But they might also know when you've waited too long in line and email you a coupon for free ice cream or a pass to another ride. And with that, they'll have hooked the white whale of customer service turning a negative experience into a positive one. It recasts your memories of a place that's why casinos comp you drinks and shows when you lose at the tables. Though Franklin wouldn't comment on the particulars of these possibilities, he did offer an intriguing summary of them. What people call the Internet of Things is just a technological underpinning that misses the point, he says. This is about the experiential Internet. The guest doesn't need to know how it happened. It's about the magic of the food arriving. These are the experiences that many more designers will soon be striving for invisible, everywhere, and, in a word, mundane. Which is its own kind of magic. This story originally stated that the design lab was next door to Buzz Lightyear Space Ranger Spin, instead of Toy Story Midway Mania. It also stated that the lab was begun in 2008. This referred to a previous iteration of the lab at another location. Finally, the story stated that John Lasseter was a Disney board member, instead of a member of Pixar's board. We regret the errors. Well Sean, shall we take a trip sometime around Christmas to check this experience out? Back to you. Well, maybe we could do that, but I think people will be upset that the show is being missed. But actually, you guys, um, that's all the time we have for this week's Tech Cove. Besides, my dinner's getting cold. <laughs> Alright guys, I will see you next week. Thanks, Steph, and, um... Uh, I'm sure joining me as a permanent co-host wouldn't be so bad, would it? <laughs> Alright, later. Thanks for listening to today's Tech Cove. 
We hope you've enjoyed today's program. Tune in again next week at the same time for another edition of The Tech Cove with your host, Sean Hosberry. This is Derek Barnes, your announcer, speaking. Speaking.